OK, in this video I'd like to continue on with my tutorials discussing complex analysis. Specifically this is video number 3 and it is my second derivation of Green's theorem. I'd like to draw your attention to my website universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed and I have also a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. Before we begin I'd like to recap on the previous videos which are relevant. I did a series of four videos discussing complex numbers in the past and in, ad in addition to that I did a video on complex numbers in 10 minutes or discuss complex numbers in 10 minutes. In video one of complex analysis I discussed the cauchy riemann conditions or the cauchy riemann equations. In video two in complex analysis I discussed the derivation of Green's theorem and I did that essentially using first principles. However in this particular video number three I'm going to build upon video number one and use the cauchy riemann equations. So the cauchy riemann conditions are written in front of you. These are for a path independent complex derivative. This is where our function is made up of a real component and an imaginary component u and v and each of those are a function of x and y. What we're going to do is use Stokes theorem and see if we can come up with Green's theorem using these cauchy riemann conditions. We have an unambiguous complex derivative where the cauchy riemann conditions are satisfied. However, we don't know if integration is unambiguous. So is integration path independent when we talk about complex numbers or a number with a both real and an imaginary component? This is basically what Green's theorem is all about. Let's consider an arbitrary complex number z. We're going to say that z is a function of u and v, each of which is a function of x and y. So we can say that f is equal to u plus i times v, where u is the real component and v is the imaginary component, each of which is a function of both x and y. Let's consider the exact same closed curve as we did in video number 2, where we went from x min equal to a, x max equal to b. We split the curve up into two separate components, namely c1, which is y1 of x, and c2 which is y2 of x. So c which is a function of z which of course therefore is a function of u and v which of course therefore is a function of x and y. We define a positive curve as going anti-clockwise. So just to say it one more time we break up the path c into two smaller paths namely c1 and c2 y1 of x and y2 of x and we join them so that their sum is equal to c. Of course, for path independence, going by C1 and C2 should be irrelevant. Mathematically, we can establish this by saying that f of z dz integrated along C1 has to be minus f of z dz integrated along C2. Of course, we can rewrite this and see that their sum is zero. This means that for conservative force fields, the closed line integral of a force field, a conservative force field, is equal to zero. And this is very important, you should know this from your physics. The closed line integral of a conservative force field is zero. Earlier we noted that f is equal to u plus i times v. So let's plug this into our expression. So we say that f is, or excuse me, z is equal to u plus i v and we have dx plus i dy is equal to dz. As I said in video number two, Green's theorem only works or is only valid for closed curves, closed line integrals. If we multiply these two expressions and group the real and imaginary components, we get u dx minus v dy and v dx minus u dy. These of course have to be equal to zero. They have to be equal to zero separately in order to have uh, in order to have independence. And as a result, we have two different integrals. Now, using the notation in the past, we could have l dx at m dy, 
and I'm going to call this one here L prime dx and M prime dy. Now there's no relationship between L and M, uh, excuse me, L and L prime, M and M prime. It's just, I'm using, that's the notation I'm going to use.